it's now time for me to launch the first session of our conference, which is the panel entitled Exploring the Multiple Dimensions of Institutional Regulatory Capture in the Area of Taxation. So I'm delighted to give the floor to the chair of the first panel, Professor Stefano Manacorda, who serves as professor in criminal law at the University of Campania, Luigi Vampitelli. Dear Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cosentino. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. So hello, everybody. It's, it's a really a pity we cannot meet in person. So first of all, let me congratulate very briefly Cosentino, congratulate and thank for this excellent initiative. Uh, Cosentino is not only a, a, a very uh, an innovative researcher, but somewhere is also an explosive one. He has a lot of ideas. He puts a lot of elements on, on the ground, on the table. And it's, as you can easily understand, we know one each other uh, since many, many years. So it's, it's for me a real pleasure to be here today at this initiative. Well, one word about the topic before uh, I will introduce uh, the panelists of this panel number one. Um, let me say that I mean at the very at the very basis of this uh, conference and the virtual project, uh, there is somewhere in uh, intuition. There is the idea that there are some connections between the misuse of public funds and particularly uh, tax frauds and uh, corruption and bribery. Um, this kind of statement is not self-evident. Uh, I think that the, the added value of this conference and more generally of this research is to highlight a certain number of interconnections between these two topics and I will also say that Constantino was so innovative because he was actually working on a topic that became a reality with the European Public Prosecutor Office that he mentioned. The European Public Prosecutor Office, of course, has some jurisdiction in relation to both these kind of offenses. So thank you again, Constantino, for giving us the opportunity to think about this topic. And let me introduce very briefly the distinguished panelists that will take the floor in this panel, entitled, as it is said by Cosentino, exploring the multiple dimensions of institution and regulatory, uh, regulatory capture in the area of taxation. We will have first um, Daniel Ostas. Daniel Ostas is, a, is the shareholder of the business ethics at the University of Oklahoma. Is an expert in business economics, business law, and business ethics. And uh, within his researchers, he has been working on a certain number of issues, including ethics of corporate legal strategy. Um, I don't think that Dan needs to be introduced more because he's very well known by the other panelists and by the audience. So I would be very happy to give him the floor. Uh, his uh, topic will be about regulatory capture and the ethics of political obligations. And he'll, he will use a title which is very intriguing in my, in my view, Indigenous Tax Law. So Daniel, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Stefano. It's uh, very much of a pleasure to be here. Indeed, my paper is entitled Endogenous Tax Law, uh, the Regulatory Capture and the Ethics of Political Obligation. Uh, we live in a world of uh, polarized public opinion. It doesn't seem like people agree on much, but there's one thing in which, uh, in which there does seem widespread agreement, and that's that special interest, uh, people who have special ac access uh, money, uh, maybe concentrated interests, uh, have uh, a disproportionate effect uh, on the creation, implementation, and reform of public policy, including tax law. Um, that's a central tenet of Marxism. It also comes directly out of uh, von Hayek. Uh, so it's not really, it's not really even debated. It's on both sides of, of the aisle. Uh, we have several uh, Chicago School economists who won the capture theory uh, Nobel Prizes in the 1970s. Uh, you have Mansur Olson and the, the political science folks uh, in, in terms of uh, 
uh, in terms of public choice, uh, University of Virginia and, and elsewhere uh, that are on board as well is pretty much common sense. Uh, that there is a, a capture uh, of the regulatory process. You see that particularly with regard to the tax cap, which is uh, defined, as we all know, uh, as the difference between um, income taxes that are due and income taxes that are collected. A recent IRS study uh, estimated that the tax gap in the United States is an amazing $600 billion. Uh, what my paper is uh, doing is trying to look at is what allows this tax gap uh, to, to continue on. And, and, uh, and in particular, I'm, I'm following the traditional framework of, uh, of the fraud triangle, but rather than focusing on the opportunity elements uh, of, uh, of, of fraud, which is the primary focus of the Virto pro pro project uh, and, other, and other presentations, I wanna look at the rationalization side uh, of the fraud triangle, because fraud triangle ultimately is motive, uh, opportunity, and rationalization, and particular look at some of the, uh, the ethical and psychological bombs that people use to justify cheating on their taxes uh, and engaging in corrupt, uh, corrupting uh, public officials and in public officials that ignore their public duties uh, and asking uh, those, uh, those taxpayers as well as those public officials to examine uh, their life, otherwise it's not worth living according to Socrates, uh, and to engage in some stoic uh, self-restraint. Perhaps I'm whistling into the wind. Uh, I believe I pretty much am because people like money and power. But nonetheless, I think somebody ought to point this out. Uh, and uh, so that's what my paper is, is uh, trying, uh, trying to do. Uh, it's written in three parts. The first part addresses uh, the ethics of uh, the taxpayer. In particular, it offers a criticism, critique, criticism of uh, financial risk management. Financial risk management in the compliance industry is the norm. Uh, basically, what you have in compliance uh, is more, by the way, there are more compliance officers now today uh, in America than there are uh, publicly employed police. It's a huge industry. And what compliance officials do is they do a survey of legal risk. Uh, they design protocols, they engage in trainings, uh, provide certain incentives and, and monitoring. Uh, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with uh, doing a financial risk assessment. Um, but it's not financial risk, uh, financial risk assessment when it comes to legal compliance can be ethically tainted. The first problem with it is that it ignores the ethical obligation to obey law and ignores the ethical, ethical component that law has uh, to the extent that law is expressing an ethic, that to, to the extent that law is um, based on uh, ethical goals, ethic, uh, uh, law has an ethical uh, component. But financial risk management ignores that. Then it, can, 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 it's, it presents law strictly as a, a financial uh, result of alternative actions that are taken by the, by the taxpayer uh, or, the, uh, or the regulated uh, entity. And then to compound matter, uh, the, uh, the actual uh, likely consequences um, are going to depend upon the, uh, the, the, the legal strategy, uh, the capture strategy, if you will, uh, of the regulated entity. And you wind up with uh, a world in which uh, financial risk management winds up being do whatever you can get away with. This is like licentious uh, admonition to do that. And then a suggestion that that's okay. That there's nothing wrong with that because everybody's doing it, or what a bandwagon effect, or or whatever the reason uh, the reason uh, m might be. Of course, there is an alternative. The alternative is is that the um, regulated entity, being in the tax realm or wherever, whatever regular, regulatory arena you're talking about, could engage in some stoic self-restraint. Um, after all, Socrates voluntarily drank some hem hemlock, so people do actually follow law just out of matter no principle uh, and potentially cooperate uh, with uh, with the uh, the regulatory uh, regulatory process uh, live to good faith interpretations of what the tax code is actually trying to to achieve uh, identify loopholes and help to close them rather than to create them and other forms of uh, responsible uh, business activities what's needed to be able to achieve that is a reframing uh, of the ethical obligations uh, of the tax uh, uh, of the tax advisor uh, and the compliance officer uh, more generally, blame is also found, of course, within the governmental entities that facilitate um, the uh, uh, the capture or, or, or cooperate with the capture. This is in all three branches of government. I start with a little quip from uh, from Obama, in which he talks about. Uh, uh, one location in the Grand Caymans where there are 12,000 uh, domiciled corporations. And he flashes a smile and says, you know, this is either the biggest building in the world or the biggest tax fraud in the world. 
He said that while he was a candidate, he was president for eight years. When he left office, that, that office is still in business. Now the Grand Games is still, is still operating. So nothing was done other than perhaps a little bit of lip service. The, IR, the, the Congress uh, defunded, during, during the Trump administration, defunded the IRS. There are studies that show one more dollar spent on, a, on a, uh, an effective uh, IRS agent will generate $8 uh, dollars in return. And thinking in terms of marginal revenue, marginal benefit, it's amazing that that doesn't happen other than the fact there's just no incentive uh, to, uh, to put money into uh, IRS uh, enforcement. And I also contend, and I've written on this elsewhere, um, that there's a, a bias within tax courts uh, in favor of a, a formalist or a textualist, if you will, uh, version of the rule of law that emphasizes uh, it emphasizes the literal interpretation uh, of the code over a more pragmatic interpretation of code. Even though we have uh, widespread uses of GARs throughout the world, five GARs in the United States, including two that have been recently codified, uh, so that if the courts wanted to be more pragmatic, they could actually change uh, change the uh, calculus that's being done uh, in the compliant by the compliance officer. Uh, the third part of the paper offers a solution. The solution, again, is uh, Stoic self-restraint. Uh, I do indeed uh, begin with Socrates, but, but then pivot to, uh, to Aristotle. Aristotle has a discussion of, of what he called epikaia, which is uh, a decency or, 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 or equity. Uh, he talks about law has an inevitable imprecision in it and that the decent or virtuous citizen will not seek to exploit those loopholes, but rather will try to do what the, the legislator had, had meant. That's not, a, it's a matter of the ontology of, of law, natural, the nature of law. You find the same idea within Adam Smith. Adam Smith thinks that people are both, uh, have two aspects and within the theory of moral sentiments. They are altruistic and they're also egoist, egoistic. Uh, altru 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 altruism uh, needs to be uh, moderated with uh, with uh, prudence to wind up with benevolence in certain settings, and you have to you have to moderate you have to moderate uh, 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 altruism uh, with with uh, prudence to get to benevolence in other types of settings. In a business setting, he talks about prudence, which is his main uh, virtue. But prudence obviously is not greed; uh, it has to do with uh, taking do do do. Uh, do account for the effect of one's actions uh, on others. But perhaps the person that makes it most clear is John Rawls. John Rawls has a deontological first order uh, a principle of civility in which he talks about not taking undue advantages of loopholes and cooperating with uh, public institutions such as, uh, such as law. So in conclusion, what I'm doing in this paper is, like I said, perhaps just whistling in the wind because basically I'm asking uh, people with a uh, prerogative and power uh, to think about just because you can doesn't mean you should, uh, to think about the rationalizations that you're using, uh, that it's okay to, to engage in uh, capture of the, of the government, that's okay as a government official to only seek uh, re-election and self-aggrandizement, uh, and uh, to engage in some self-restraint. People are amazingly complicated individuals. They can be extremely selfish in one context and extremely altruistic in another. And I'm asking for them to reflect upon the human condition uh, and to engage in some self-restraint. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you for highlighting such a short time, such a complex topic. What you were referring to does not apply only to US, unfortunately. It all also applies to all the other, at least democracy that we know in Western countries and probably at a wider level. I'm very interested in myself as being a criminal lawyer that you are actually, uh, you know, mentioning as a main idea the, the shift from egoism to altruism without referring to any sanction or to any penalty. I'm glad to hear that. And there will be a lot of um, elements to be discussed within your, within your presentation. Uh, I will probably leave it for the floor or maybe at the, at the end of this session to get some questions for you. I do have some questions for you. Hopefully we will have the time to discuss them. So thank you again. And I will now give the floor to Gaetana. Gaetana Morgante, she's a professor at Santana University in Pisa. She's been a former fellow of, at the Max Planck Institute. And she's a very good colleague of mine and friend. She's an expert in, she's a criminal lawyer and she's an expert in uh, uh, all the issues related to business, criminal law, and corporate criminal liability, 
help Gaetana, she, she could connect, she had a trouble with yeah, Gaetana. She yes, yes. Gaetana. And before giving the floor to Gaetana, uh, I will actually say that she will highlight the other side of the medal. She will deal with corruption and she will uh, in particular explain why corruption is a, a multi offenses uh, from different points of view. Thank you very much, Gaetana, you have the floor. Thanks indeed to you, uh, Stefano. Uh, can you only confirm me if you properly uh, see the presentation? Everything is fine. We can hear you. We can we can okay. see. Your, Thank you. Your Thank you so much. So. Thanks indeed for giving me this important opportunity to join the final international conference of the Virtue Project. Thanks indeed also to the colleague and friend Costantino Grasso and uh, all the organizers of uh, the conference. My uh, very brief presentation will focus on the uh, complexity of corruption as a, a multi-offenses uh, system and uh, um, I will try to analyze very, very briefly with you um, how and why corruption never stands alone from different points of view, namely from a criminological and economic uh, criminal law in a, in a more strict sense, uh, and finally a law enforcement point of view. Starting from uh, the criminological point of view of the analysis of the complexity of corruption, um, I would like to propose you this uh, figure um, to describe corruption uh, as uh, a gear of a part, a gear of an engine, uh, starting from uh, different crimes such as tax evasion and corporate crimes more in general, in order to save, to set aside uh, the uh, financial resources to be used uh, for future corruption activities. Uh, and uh, this complexity of corruption, uh, this connection of corruption with other kinds of crimes uh, uh, can be seen, in my opinion, not only in connection with corporate crimes, I mean with uh, uh, crimes committed in the framework of, uh, let me say, illicit uh, organizations, but also when uh, these, uh, uh, these um, first crimes, these functional crimes to um, in the future commit corruption are performed by um, uh, organized crime, by um, organized criminal groups uh, um, using corruption in order to infiltrate the legal economy and after corruption activities, uh, uh, performing uh, money laundering uh, crimes in order to conceal the um, criminal proceedings of corruption itself. And uh, let me also underline the similarities and the differences from a criminological point of view between tax evasion, tax avoidance, and corruption. Both crimes are characterized by a significant dark figure. But uh, um, uh, while tax evasion is uh, also characterized by a uh, general law uh, perception uh, of the uh, criminal relevance of this uh, criminal activity, uh, the uh, perception uh, of the criminal relevance of corruption is uh, um, uh, really uh, high. And, uh, uh, also from an economic point of view, corruption is uh, a part of a complex uh, system because as I said before, corruption never stands alone uh, and uh, is characterized by this connection uh, um, before and after the criminal program uh, with other kind of uh, crimes uh, in um, uh, in order to uh, manage uh, the um, financial, the economic resources connected to uh, the um, uh, commission of uh, corruption. And also from a criminal law point of view, in a more uh, detailed 
ill-led perspective, uh, uh, corruption is a, a part of a very complex system because corruption and maybe even in the cases of uh, the so-called petty corruption uh, is uh, almost never an instant crime, uh, an individual crime uh, performed alone, but is a part of a criminal plan uh, concerning also different uh, kinds of crime, uh, economic and non particularly economic forms of illicit. Uh, let me um, briefly also uh, move to the final part of this uh, very, very brief presentation on the complexity of corruption, focusing on the law enforcement uh, point of view. Um, the complexity of corruption and of the phenomenology of corruption has, in my opinion, is really urgent, necessary, that is, um, connected also with the, the complexity of the law enforcement and prevention strategies system. Uh, the uh, traditional law enforcement paradigm uh, based uh, on the continuous increasing of the penalties of the sanctions provided for the forms of corruption also linked uh, with uh, um, economic crimes and in particular with uh, taxes evasion is, uh, um, is uh, um, uh, not so uh, efficient uh, also because of the significant uh, dark figure of uh, uh, corruption and the low deterrence uh, of uh, capacity of this uh, traditional framework uh, of uh, law enforcement paradigm. Uh, maybe uh, it's, uh, um, it's more uh, efficient uh, and useful uh, to address the complexity of corruption as uh, a criminal plan to um, focus on the necessity of uh, a change of paradigm of law enforcement uh, based on uh, the, um, the uh, strong anticip anticipation of the threshold uh, of the criminal intervention and on the synergy with uh, preventive measures uh, and, uh, above all administrative preventive measures. And from this point of view, the complexity of the law enforcement system and the prevention system of uh, corruption has to be also linked uh, with the, um, the, the, the synergy between uh, different uh, um, strategies and uh, prevention policies uh, um, uh, implemented uh, not only um, referring to the anti-corruption strategies, but uh, considering the, complex, the complexity of the phenomenon, also with uh, the, uh, the um, uh, anti-tax avoidance strategies uh, the anti-money laundering strategies uh, and uh, the, um, the um, uh, terrorist financing uh, uh, strategies. Um, uh, focusing also on the uh, necessity of the prevention of corruption, uh, it's uh, also very important in this final conference, I think, to underline the importance of the dissemination of the ethical before then uh, legal uh, values uh, um, connected uh, with the prevention and fighting uh, of uh, corruption. Uh, I'm referring to the values uh, of uh, democracy, of uh, integrity, transparency, efficiency of uh, public services, uh, and uh, the uh, dissemination more in general uh, of the um, anti corruption culture um, also uh, through events uh, like uh, the one we are uh, living in this moment uh, of uh, public uh, engagement. Uh, let me uh, move in the uh, 10 minutes assigned to me uh, to the uh, last figure with um, 
I would like to close my, my presentation. I would like to repropose you the, uh, the first figure uh, of the engine, but uh, replacing in the different gears uh, the crimes uh, with uh, the uh, prevention strategies of the uh, illicit activities uh, um, that are the uh, parts of this uh, uh, complex phenomenon that have to uh, to be uh, connected um, in uh, order to uh, follow uh, the, and uh, uh, implement the complexity of the uh, criminal phenomenology with the complexity of the law enforcement uh, uh, strategies. Uh, I mean, the law enforcement uh, officers and more in general, the law enforcement agencies um, uh, have are obliged to um, to follow and to um, uh, adapt uh, their uh, capacity uh, to the complexity of the uh, phenomenon, uh, even in the particular moment we are uh, experiencing now um, uh, directly uh, after the uh, pandemics uh, and uh, the uh, availability of uh, significant amounts of financial resources and uh, um, in, uh, in this moment I think uh, it's uh, very important to uh, work all together on this uh, uh, complex uh, but uh, efficient synergy between different law enforcement and prevention strategies uh, uh, facing uh, um, uh, till the end uh, let me say the uh, complexity of uh, corruption so thank you very much for your kind attention and I am available uh, uh, for uh, questions uh, and um, uh, other clarification uh, you uh, eventually need. Thanks indeed. Thank you, Gaetana. Professor Nogant has shown how important it was to have the possibility, uh, we have now another screen, to have the possibility to work uh, and to think about the connections between uh, corruption or bribery and, 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 and tax evasion. But let me say that I do see two possible connections. One was highlighted uh, is the fact that through tax evasion, you have the funds for corruption. The other way around is that uh, you avoid through corruption enforcement and control so tax avoidance and tax evasion. Um, there is something that Gaetana was mentioning that I perfectly share, but I think is a challenging idea, even when we discuss with not uh, criminal lawyers, and is the fact that increasing penalties in this area is not actually the solution. Well, I think it's a very sensitive point that we need to communicate to all other colleagues that thank you for doing that. I personally share it. I'm almost sure that it's not so self-evident for many of the other researchers. And it would be helpful to, 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 if we have the possibility to come back to this point later on. So we have now our third panelist. And our third panelist is Dr. Ina Kube. Uh, Ina is a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Political Science, Government and International Relations in Tel Aviv. She researches and teaches on corruption, migration, and conflict resolutions. And she, uh, she works with a certain number of national and international institutions. So Ina will actually focus on the relationships between tax abuses and human rights. Uh, you have the floor, Ina. Thank you very much. Thank you so much as well. Thanks for the invitation and also for the very interesting uh, presentations before. So I will focus on the link between uh, tax corruption and human rights violations. And um, I wrote a paper together with Martin Koch Anderson from the University of uh, Copenhagen. And now I would like to 
talk in particular about this paper, of course, but I also would like to bring a new dimension into that, the role of a state capture. So I think it's uh, yeah, uh, all clear to us, or we agree on that, that uh, of course corruption has uh, high detrimental effects on our human well-being and in particular on our human rights. Um, and there is already some literature on that, uh, that uh, yeah, reveals the strong relationship between corruption and um, human rights violations, but uh, the topic on uh, tax corruption is still largely understudied. So that's why it's very important that, um, yeah, we're meeting and exchanging our perspectives and uh, our opinions and data in particular. Um, so the topic is still not really on our, on our agenda, on the business agenda and on the human rights agenda and also not on the research. Why should we care? Because we know that uh, corruption benefits the few at the expense of the many. And of course, it's a misuse of entrusted power for private gain. And it's very important to emphasize again that there is always a victim. So no matter what's uh, happening when we talk about corruption, there's always a victim. And when we talk about uh, human rights violations, uh, in particular, the society, is suffering from corruption, or in this case, fiscal um, tax corruption. So uh, Morten and I, uh, we are analyzing the effects or the consequences of tax corruption and uh, human rights. And uh, we also stress that we are not trying to establish a causal relationship. Uh, at first, we want to show that there is a that there is a correlation between the both. So it's more about uh, how tax evasion as a form of corruption is related to the violations of uh, citizens' rights. Because we can see that fiscal corruption undermines the ability of a state and, of course, particularly the capacity to promote, to protect, and enforce the enjoyment of human rights. And for that, we need a stronger victim oriented approach. Uh, we focused on three case studies uh, that are related to European banking sector, and uh, I don't have time, of course, to go deeper into that. And you can, of course, if you're interested, uh, read the paper. Uh, just to summarize it, uh, we have a look at the Fresenius model, a German uh, company, Panama Papers, and the Danske Bank money laundry scale, a scandal that uh, shows uh, the strong interactions between corruption, or in this case, um, tax fraud or um, fiscal corruption related to the violation of, uh, of, of our rights, of human rights. Um, taxation is, of course, uh, very important for us. Uh, we need taxation. We need uh, the distribution of wealth, of course, in a society, uh, also to decrease uh, inequality, social, political, and economic inequality. And, of course, we need uh, taxes uh, to provide the quality of basic services and, of course, also to ensure um, to save um, our rights. So uh, tax policy are also a vehicle for pursuing our social political uh, objectives, in particular reducing poverty and, as I said before, reducing inequality in general, because we can see, of course, around the globe that there is an increase, a constant increase of inequality. The issue is that there are, of course, different uh, jurisdictions in every country, which enables um, yeah, corrupt actors um, to um, find loopholes for their corrupt practices. And one of these practices uh, is also state capture. And I will talk about state capture uh, in a few seconds. Uh, but before that, I want to make clear again uh, how the relationship between corruption and or fiscal corruption, human rights violation looks in particular. We have like three levels of violations where we talk about the respect, protection, and the fulfillment of human rights. So in general, it's of course limiting the state's capacities. It's undermining the quality of basic public services. And in general, it has of course a negative impact uh, um, on the ability of the states to deliver services that everybody is in need of. So uh, we can say that there is, of course, a strong relationship between the both, and that's why we need a stronger human rights-based approach and have a, a very specific, a very deep 
look into this uh, into this complex um, relationship because in general it harms the trust in government. It's reducing institutional trust and of course can also lead to social, economic and political instability. Uh, when I talk about state capture, um, I mean the efforts of firms to shape the laws, policies and regulations of the state to their own advantage by providing illicit private gains to public officials. So this is um, one of the uh, definitions of uh, state capture. In general, state capture is when the state is captured by elites of private interest. And in particular, in, the, um, in a Central and Eastern Europe or in transitional countries, how we call it, or post-communist uh, societies, this is a huge problem. And we need to focus on this more also, of course, related to um, tax corruption. Um, we conclude our paper uh, with recommendations uh, to, uh, to European Union and European Union member states. They are also in line uh, with the recommendations of uh, the UNCA correlation from, uh, correlation from 2021. Of course, we need more transparency uh, when we talk about company ownership in the private sector, advancing open contracting. We need more access to information. We see it's a huge issue still. Uh, asset declarations, we need a higher independence of anti-corruption bodies. Uh, we need to include the civil society more um, that can act as watch, uh, watchdogs and keep the government and private companies accountable. We need to promote an, an environment, of course, for civil societies and journalists so that they can do their job in a proper way. Uh, we need to enhance and increase the security of national companies and their international dealings and financial transactions, of course. And uh, as a last point, we need to establish uh, tax abuse as a violation of human rights, including the uh, including facilitating of transaction and hosting of finances, in particular tax havens. But as I said, we need to uh, we need a strong case by case uh, approach uh, because the context uh, plays a very important role into that. So we need tailored approaches when we need a when we um, want to analyze it uh, in a proper way. The link between tax abuses and human rights violations. Uh, so as I said, uh, we need this victim based approach. We need a more human rights based approach. And uh, we also need a stronger look at the role of state capture in particular in these days. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ina. <clears throat> yes, very brilliant presentation uh, that I think was useful uh, even more when we connect your presentation with what has been said before. First, you are right in saying that the huge gap between what is what should be paid in terms of tax and what is paid can affect human rights. And so we are reconnecting what Daniel presentations in relation to this gap. Uh, but I also see, see a, I mean, a sort of risk in in the idea that uh, the violation, sorry, the tax evasion is a serious violation of human rights. And it's exactly the same risk that was highlighted by Gaetana. So we should take into consideration that this is a very severe offense with a huge impact of public funds and probably public services. And do we consider that as an aggravating factor or as something that should bring to a very severe consequence in terms of punishment or uh, should we take into account what Gaetano was saying in terms of prevention and synergy related to corruption, of course, but related also to tax offenses? We are, you know, facing a certain number of dilemmas that, I'm, of course, I will not deal with here. Um, my interest was just to focus on how, uh, uh, you know, interconnected were your presentations and. Uh, how much we could actually speculate in a certain number of topics that we are uh, exposing so clearly in such a short time. Uh, I will now give the floor to our last panelist. Uh, our last panelist is Jason McLean. Jason is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of New Brunswick. 
and is also an adjunct professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability of the University. I'm probably going to pronounce that very badly. Saskatchewan. And uh, Jason's works very much on climate change and sustainability law and policy. And his presentation is extremely interesting because he will exactly focus on these topics and more in particular, the title of this presentation is the following one, regulatory capture, complexity and academics. We feel that we are all interested very much in this presentation. Thank you, Jason, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. And, and thank you for the, uh, the invitation to, to be part of this really fascinating uh, discussion. It brings to mind immediately a couple of years ago when the Business Roundtable breathlessly announced uh, their new vision of stakeholder capitalism. And the economist Joseph Stiglitz uh, reacted skeptically by saying that he would believe that the world's largest corporations were truly prepared to usher in a new form of capitalism when they first paid their taxes. So I think there's a really interesting and obvious connection between uh, tax, um, corporate conduct, and, and regulatory capture. Uh, as Stefano mentioned, I'm not uh, a tax scholar, and that, what I just mentioned, is going to be probably my only tax reference in my, in my brief discussion. But um, my research into regulatory capture, both in respect of uh, energy and climate uh, regulation, and also more recently, agrochemical uh, regulation, has a natural tie-in to the presentations we've already heard today which is the, the importance of both uh, complexity and um, the role of academics along with uh, public participation. So let me just dive in. Um, in, the, in the past, in my, in my initial research um, in these areas, I've focused on the importance of academics playing a more direct and explicit role in public policy making as a means of trying to level uh, the informational and expertise playing field as between uh, regulated firms, their in industries and their, and their lobbyists on the one hand and regulators on the other. Uh, and I remain committed to that idea, but I want to complicate the story a little bit by talking about uh, some of the, the limitations, both internal and external to, to academics playing uh, this role. And I think uh, we'll see some of the, the tie-ins with the presentations that we've already heard um, this afternoon. Um, some of the key internal, and I mean internal to academics, uh, limitations include what I call uh, the cult of nuance and the pronounced lack of consensus among academics on any uh, complex matter. And in many ways, that's a, a virtue and it's built into the academic enterprise. Uh, we tend to disagree and we try to have interesting and fruitful and productive disagreements, uh, but that can, that can limit uh, academics' ability to counter uh, the usually far more simplified and homogenous uh, strategic messaging of regulated industries and their lobbyists. Um, the next is what I view as uh, self-censorship, political conformism, and the myths of objectivity and neutrality that scholars often face. And in particular, um, so this works in two ways, this, this limitation. On the one hand, um, it's always surprising to me as a, a law scholar and a policy scholar that more people aren't studying regulatory capture. I, when I first broke into uh, environmental law in academia after being a practicing litigator, uh, it was immediately apparent to me that while environmental law, pro law professors would complain 
about how inadequate uh, our laws were and our levels of enforcement were, they rarely investigated or even addressed the root problem, which was the fact that the regulated industries, and I'm speaking primarily of Canada, but it's a story that has worldwide uh, applicability, uh, these rules and regulations were being written by the regulatory uh, entities themselves. And I mean literally so. In Canada, uh, the oil and gas industry has literally taken the pen and held the pen in writing uh, key climate and energy laws. So why would you expect them to promote environmental protection? Um, and yet, uh, most scholars still do not focus or zero in on, on regulatory capture. And on the other hand, those that do um, face charges of not being objective or not being uh, scientifically neutral, and these myths are like zombies that are almost impossible uh, to slay. Um, two more uh, internal limitations I'll just briefly mention. Uh, there are opportunity costs, both economic and informational, uh, with associated with participating in public interest-based uh, regulatory engaged research. And I think the last one really deserves mention and it becomes immediately apparent after listening to the fascinating conversations already on this panel that uh, interdisciplinarity is required, but interdisciplinarity is much easier said than done and again, most academics are simply not interested in, in working in an interdisciplinary way. Um, now add to that some key external barriers to professors playing a more direct and explicit role in public interest policymaking to try and capture, uh, to counter regulatory capture. Uh, first is, is that there are a number of academics who work for industry uh, as quote unquote guns for hire um, in order to sow the seeds of uncertainty and doubt. We are also working in, and this has already been acknowledged this morning, as much as I admire Daniel's call to uh, Socratic in, uh, introspection and Aristotelian uh, equality and good faith, uh, we do live and work increasingly in an era of political polarization, uh, populism, anti-intellectualism, uh, including um, a, a sort of, I think, new and unprecedented attacks on even the, the idea of, of expertise. And then it, uh, this takes me to one that I've been um, working, uh, experiencing quite a bit recently in Canada, which is um, regula regulators and policymakers, on the one hand, indifference uh, to academics, and on the other hand, sometimes uh, hostility. And I want to return to a really interesting point that Daniel made at the outset of his presentation, which is that regulatory capture is common sense. It's, it's arrived as a kind of a, a bipartisan um, acknowledgement of the reality in which we live, uh, both sides of the aisle uh, accept this. And I, I think there's, there's truth to that, um, but regulatory capture is interpreted uh, differently depending on both sides of the aisle. So, uh, and I, I think a whole book has been written about this, so I can't go into too much detail about it, but left progressives, who have undertaken, and I would put myself in that category, who have undertaken regulatory capture research with the idea of drawing attention to uh, the need for regulatory reform, uh, have in some ways played into the hands of the initial neoliberal critics of regulatory capture before neoliberalism was even coined. And, and Stigler would be, would be part of that, who would use the, the critique of regulatory capture not as a means for spurring regulatory reform, but rather as a means of arguing for deregulation altogether and quote unquote free market prioritization. And 
one of the ways that I've actually experienced personally in my work uh, that this, this happens is that regulators themselves, when you're trying to engage with them, aren't thrilled to learn that you think that they've been captured uh, by, the, by the, the firms and the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. And this can create uh, friction uh, when trying to sort of get on their side and to help them with independent academic act expertise. So I, I remain committed to the idea that academics have a key role, even a responsibility to play in using our privileged position as knowledge brokers to help level this playing field of asymmetric information, which is one of the key um, risk factors and preconditions of regulatory capture, the increasing complexity of regulation in modern life. And I think in a, in a forum like this, it, it, it almost goes without saying. But I think academics have to begin to really strategically rethink how they go about this project, not only by foregrounding the focus on regulatory reform and the capacity of state regulation, indeed the necessity of state regulation and Ina's presentation really makes that point uh, quite well. Um, but also uh, thinking about how to draw in greater levels of public participation. This, I think, is the, the largest challenge before academics who want to work in an engaged and responsible way on regulatory capture. And we're not very good at it institutionally or, or as a type. We make calls for greater civil society inclusion. The work of investigative journalists in particular is really important um, in collaborating with other sectors of society to try and empower them. Um, but we, we tend to talk amongst ourselves and what we say doesn't translate very well into that public sphere. In, in many ways, regulatory capture is not merely uh, or even significantly a technocratic problem, although it often appears that way in our work. Uh, one of my colleagues put it really well when she said that regulatory capture holds up a mirror to democratic society and it reveals the growing level of public uh, and civil society and democratic disengagement with the very uh, regulatory and policy making processes that deliver you know basic um, uh, social needs and social objectives and uh, state obligations. And so I'll wrap up um, very briefly just by saying that academics have to begin to develop, I think, a more nuanced interdisciplinary and uh, publicly engaged model of research that seeks to counter uh, regulatory capture. And one that also accounts for um, our growing understanding of motivated reasoning. Um, so in terms of Socratic uh, introspection, you know, the main areas that I work in uh, are areas where the fossil fuel industry on the one hand and the agrochemical industry on the other hand are playing an outsized role in moving uh, regulation and policy making away from the public interest to their own private interests. But it's more than that. They're, they have been for decades and continue to be very effective in shaping the narrative around what is in the public interest in a manner that's consistent with their own private special interests. And they believe it. So the fossil fuel industry doesn't wake up in the morning and say, well, uh, let's get back to work another day uh, for more regulatory capture. They say we're fueling the world. The, agro uh, the agrochemical industry doesn't wake up and say it's time to wake up and capture the state so we can poison the world. Uh, companies like Monsanto uh, think that they're feeding the world. 
And so we have to understand and become more strategic about how we engage uh, in these discussions about what in fact is the public interest, how it's been captured and, and how to uh, escape that capture and shift regulation back to what is the proper public interest. And that's a much larger conversation, but I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for you. Well, it was a very fascinating and provocative uh, presentation, of course, even because you address yourself to such a number of uh, academics. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, I do think that before giving the, the floor to the audience, and I will uh, turn myself to Constantino, if I can take three questions from the audience, just a very short commentary. Well, uh, both Ina and you, you mentioned very much the issue of the state cap uh, capture and uh, regulatory capture. And I think there is a, a piece of the puzzle which is missing here, uh, which is, um, is there the need, apart from the risks, uh, is there any need for having uh, private companies and private power sitting at the table for co-regulating a certain number of technical areas. You were mentioning uh, oil and gas, you were mentioning agriculture, I will actually add a certain number of other issues. Pharmaceutical sector is a typical one. Um, is there a need? I mean, in both your presentations, I, I found a very strong criticism against you know, any kind of of um, you know, approach that private sector could have to these issues. I'm, I'm actually wondering, without having a clear opinion on that, I'm actually wondering, wondering whether or not we should also include these private actors within the elaboration of public policies. Are they just enemies, uh, counterparties, or are they part of the discussion? I leave it open. And I will take three questions. Uh, the first one is for Dan. And I just read it, but I think that Dan can read it uh, easily. So I see professor, and I was addressing to you, Daniel, do you not think it's the dangerous to leave this to the altruism of human populace, which is increasing selfish, capitalistic, and tending more towards right-wing politics? Dan, if you want to have not more than two minutes, and with, with the, I mean, with the help of Constantino, I hope, for, uh, you know, presenting your arguments on that. Thank you very much. Well, I have a, I have a direct response. And the direct response is it's not either or. Um, I'm, you, you, you do everything you can. One of the things you try to do is to get people to reflect on their rationalizations. Uh, I thought Jason's point with regard to Monsanto, thinking that they're feeding the world and, and the petrochemical company thinking they're fueling the rural world, well, they need to reflect a little bit more on the effects they're having on the world. Uh, and, and does that mean that we, because I'm just calling for altruism, that, uh, that I don't want to have a, a, a shift in the regulatory policy uh, and more greater transparency with regard to human rights effects uh, and the other types of good suggestions that are being made uh, throughout this panel? No, of course not. I, I think we should do both. Um, I'm just suggesting that uh, we sort of ignore and, and, and uh, uh, at our detriment uh, the, the role that's played by the ability to rationalize. And in particular, the one thing that I think is somewhat unique, most of what I say is pretty commonsensical, but there is one, one thing that's kind of unique in what I'm talking about, and that is the, the drumbeat for financial risk management as a driver of compliance. Uh, there's almost no challenge to that whatsoever. It's just like, an, it, it, but there is an emerging uh, literature out there on compliance. Uh, sometimes compliance is called uh, legal compliance, legal compliance and ethics. Um, but uh, when, when you look at it, you say, well, how can I believe what you say when I see what you do? Uh, and, uh, and and is there really any ethics involved in, in this? And, and, and to the extent that we can get some, some reflection on that, as well as incentives. So the answer is, no, I don't think that just appealing to altruism is going to work. But I do think playing to al appealing to altruism is one of the one of the arrows in our quiver, in our quiver, and we ought to fire it. Thank you for your optimism, and I also share some of your thoughts related to compliance. Well, Carlos Alberto Araujo, 
he has two questions. One is for Ina. Uh, Nina, you said the meaning taxation of course, and what is the empirical evidence that taxation de facto benefits society as a war? It's, it's, it's a large question. In particular, uh, small and medium enterprises like through the global economy, I have an hypothesis that little to no taxes is much better for emerging economies than raising taxes, case of United Arab Emirates. Well, Ina, I will congratulate you in advance if you will be able to answer in one minute, but that's all <laughs> And uh, in any case, I mean, the floor is for you. Okay, I'm just reading for the, I, I haven't seen the question before. So it's better for, okay. Um, yeah, first of all, I also want to react um, to the other comments in the chat. And I mean, of course, if we could do something uh, and uh, catch, so to say, uh, these companies, we would, but as you see, we cannot. And that's why we're uh, sitting here and working together. And I would also like uh, to, to um, stress again how important it is that we have an interdisciplinary approach. Because, I mean, I'm a political scientist and my co-author is anthropologist. And of course, we also need economists. Uh, we need um, people with a strong uh, law background. So uh, I really, um, yeah, encourage to uh, to let uh, to work together. Um, I think, and I uh, and I could also share, of course, studies with you that are showing how important it is that we get taxes. And I think I would, in contrast to your example, I would highly. Um, uh, stress, of course, the welfare states and the Scandinavian countries, uh, which uh, work with the distribution of wealth uh, quite well, as you can see. Also, if we have a look at uh, their um, their happiness index in general, how satisfied they are with their governments and also with the private sector. So I think we need more regulations there without uh, leaving taxation out. Like, I mean, we are working, we have our incomes, and of course, it should also be our, um, should also be uh, like our part of the society to give something back that can be invested in infrastructure and hospitals and, uh, and in particular people that have less income and also uh, who belong to more marginalized uh, and more like minorities, of course, um, in the society. So. Yes, I would agree. I would say this again. Of course, we need taxation, and I would also. I, I will look now for some studies and show you how it works. Thank you, in a big effort for giving your position, but it was very clear. And there will be a last question for Jason, always arising from Carlos Alberto Araujo, uh, which is more general addressed to the panel. Can Artificial intelligence or T blockchain mitigate compliance capital risk for small and medium enterprises. My observation is increasing compliance benefits large corporation forces small and medium enterprises with bankruptcy to merge or to be acquired. Well, I don't know, Carlos. Sorry, Jason, if this is a question for you. Uh, I don't. I don't really see a connection. But if you feel that you could add anything to this issue well you're more than welcome i don't with all due respect i don't think i can really uh, add anything to that i haven't given any thought to it it's interesting but I'm, I'm probably not the best person to address it well i think we are extremely timeless no it's not true we are extremely timely today and uh, we were we have been asked by Constantino to, to terminate our panel at 10 past four, but since he took five minutes, we were well, extremely in a compliant with the rules. I wish to thank all the panelists. It was a very fascinating exchange for me. I hope there will be new opportunities and exchanges. Of course, I, I want to congratulate again the, organiz the organizers and Constantino and thank all the audience as well that also took part to this exchange virtually. Thank you very much all.
Thank you very much, Stefano, for chairing this uh, panel. Thank you, Gaetana, Ina, Dan, and Jason. It was Thank a fascinating you. discussion. It was great to have you with us. And let's have now a six-minute sharp break, and we will reconvene at 20. Uh...